I'm honored that, that Peter Lyons has returned as a chair uh, again this year in a different area, but he was nice enough to, to come to the University of Chicago last year, he's based in New York. And this year, we've got a really challenging and interesting question, <laughs> which is how might one navigate all of the competition and antitrust and regulatory uncertainty, and what are the new techniques and methods we can use to improve the outcomes of deals knowing going in that it's a very, very unclear environment. And so we're honored to have this uh, panel assembled of uh, expertise and scar tissue and war stories <laughs> to share what's worked and the, at least to help you think more effectively about navigating these issues. So uh, Peter will introduce himself and his practice at Freshfields and everyone else, and then we'll get this uh, next discussion underway. So thank you for being here. Well, well thank you, William. Um, as, uh, as William said, I'm Peter Lyons. I'm an M&A lawyer I'm based in, in New York uh, for Freshfields, and I've been doing M&A uh, actually far, more, far too many years more than I, I care to admit to. Um, we've got an interesting panel here. We've got two antitrust lawyers, and we've got two M&A lawyers. And so we're going to deal with, you know, not going to deal a lot with antitrust substance. We may get into it. I think Gil and, and Chuck may veer into it. But really, we're going to talk about how to manage and allocate risk. So um, why don't I ask, uh, we'll start with Gil and then go across. You guys introduce yourselves, and then I'll throw out some questions. Hi, I'm Gil O'Hanna. I run the antitrust team at Cisco, the leading manufacturer of networking equipment in the world. Um, I've done probably about 100 to 120 HSR reportable deals in a you know, 20, 25 year legal career, um, and as well as a number of European Commission deals, German deals, Chinese deals, et cetera. So um, what we're gonna talk about is kind of what I spend my life doing, which is often negotiating with um, typically sellers on how when I trust risk will get allocated in, uh, in any transactions. Uh, hi, I'm, my name is Brendan Bowes. I'm associate GC at Archer Daniel Midlands, uh, just uh, down the river a little bit. Um, my background is primarily M&A. I spent uh, 10 years at Sidley Austin here in Chicago doing M&A work uh, and joined ADM last year. So um, happy to bring a sort of general corporate M&A lawyer's perspective to the antitrust discussion here. Afternoon, everyone. My name is Chuck Webb. I'm a senior antitrust lawyer for FedEx. Um, I've actually been with FedEx as of yesterday, uh, exactly a year. Um, but before that, I was about five years with Walmart, uh, the senior director for antitrust compliance uh, globally for Walmart. And before that, was a partner in the anti antitrust group at Baker Botts. So um, kind of like Gil, I've seen all sorts of transactions in all sorts of jurisdictions, both from an in-house perspective and an outside counsel perspective, and hopefully can uh, um, gain, uh, share some of that knowledge uh, today. So, so let me kick this off and direct this to, to Gil and Chuck, whichever you guys wants to start first. If you look at the deals you've done, how often is antitrust a serious issue in your deals? I mean, percentage-wise, how often do you, do you really have to grapple with it and how often is it easy? So I'd say from my perspective, Peter, I mean, again, coming from... FedEx, before that Walmart, I mean, you're generally looking at kind of your classic horizontal overlaps uh, analysis. I'd say very few raise real substantive antitrust issues, maybe 3%, 5% of the deals I've had to deal with. Now, I want to say, though, that, and this is not the main top point, of, point of the top point of our panel, but I do want to mention to the council in this room that, it, let's say you have 5% of deals which are problematic. It doesn't say you can take your eye off the other 95% of the deals as antitrust counsel. No, there's, if you have a reportable transaction, you will have gun jumping risks in 100% of your deals. Now, this is not a gun jumping panel. That's a separate discussion. But you, know, you just need to still focus on that as antitrust counsel. But real substantive issues leading to the contractual stuff we're talking about today in terms of risk shifting provisions and breakup fee or reverse breakup fees, I'd say roughly 5%. Now, you may, in your, in your world, maybe, maybe north of that, given your company. I think I'd echo, I mean, there was a term aqua hire that was used before that's very popular in, in, in Silicon Valley. Um, a lot of our deals are tech and talent aqua hire deals where we're buying an engineering team. Those deals will rarely raise antitrust issues. They'll rarely require antitrust notifications. Um, if you look kind of at the deals north of, say, $500 million, which for us is, you know, can be 5 to 10 a year, um, I'd say about a third of those will have some degree of antitrust notifications. 
um, antitrust risk, et cetera. I'd also point out, in addition to the point that Chuck made, which I totally agree with, about um, not taking your eye off the others, um, a well-functioning corporate development team, and I think at Cisco we're, we're, we're proud to, to have one of those, um, it, it's not just the deals that you do, it's the deals that you think about, and often those will require a fair amount of antitrust analysis as well, even though they, for one reason or another, don't wind up going forward. And I've had deals that have cratered on the eve of signing where I've done, you know, months of antitrust work mm -hmm. and suddenly the deal dies. Um, so um, those wouldn't, wouldn't figure into the percentage, but they're a significant part of my workload. So, but let's talk also about not just substance, but let's talk about timing and all those filings because, you know, newsflash, um, the number of jurisdictions where filings are required has gone through the roof. Um, but how does that, think, how do you think about that on, and maybe I'll ask Brenda on the sell side, right? How do you think about the, those filings and the time, time it will take in terms of thinking about the sell side of a transaction? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that it's become increasingly uh, a key factor in terms of how you think about the structure of a deal and and the merits of a deal and how you can get from you know how you can achieve your business objectives is is the timing factor and antitrust is one of the biggest drivers of that as uh, antitrust regimes around the globe you know seem to multiply and become more aggressive and um, and as business becomes more global you know obviously that that compounds the issue so I think from the sell side um, you know at some point uh, during your your sale process uh, the analysis of what those filings are going to be becomes a, a key driver and having a good grip on that um, at the appropriate stage of the transaction as you start uh, you know working through the contract issues and, and the terms with the potential buyers, uh, that, that's going to be a, a critical piece. So but, let's, so, but let's think how it impacts the time from sign to close. So if we think about your typical public company acquisition in the U.S., let's use as a straw man, cash merger, let's assume it's four months. Maybe it's three and a half, maybe it's five, but it's somewhere in that range when you get rid of the, re the, the regulatory issues. I mean, I think, um, Brendan, I think you probably agree with that as a yeah, general. Sure, yeah, sure. Somewhere in that range, I think that's my experience. I think it's, and mine's not unique. But let's think about, okay, when you layer on top of that, let's just go through it. Hart Scott in the U.S., if you've got a second request, how, long, how much do you budget for that? If you, let's assume you say, gee, it's a 50% chance I'm going to get a second request. What's that going to do to your timeline? Maybe I'll ask Gil to start with that. I mean, if it's a real second request where the, the government's going to require... Not talking to pull and refile, full, like a real full, one. Full compliance, um, I would say you're adding a minimum of about six months. Oh. I mean, there, there, there are things you can do to shorten that in terms of sort of pre-pulling documents, anticipating what the second request is going to look like, trying to kind of gather as much information as you can ahead of time. Your ability to do that real well is, is somewhat limited. Um, but, you know, I, I, I think it's six months is a good rule, an additional six months is a good rule of thumb. If you're interested in additional information on innovation and M&A, I encourage you to check out the Transaction Advisors Institute, which is a robust source for knowledge on M&A best practice. We host a series of M&A conferences, run an elite M&A academy, offer M&A masterclasses, conduct M&A research, organize the M&A Leadership Council, and publish a prestigious M&A journal. Members of the Transaction Advisors Institute include corporate executives, board members, and private equity investors that are interested in understanding the critical issues impacting transaction planning, structuring, and execution. I encourage you to get more involved in the Institute. And so let's go, but let's turn, let's go across the Atlantic and let's talk about, let's assume we're at the EU, okay? How much, what do you budget? Let's assume we've got a deal which may have some EU issues. How do we think about the timing for that? I mean, Chuck, more I, or less, what do you think? I would say more. I mean, I think in that, in that scenario, especially if you're looking at both, both uh, uh, extended reviews in both the U.S. and EU, I'd be hesitant to go anything less than a year. 
And of course, we're, you are, I'll be sure you're getting there, but we're ignoring the huge, the huge other question, of which I'm sure you're getting to, which is. Well, I mean, the real question, let's go to China. Yeah. And how do you, I mean, let's just ask, how do you predict how long it's going to take in China? So I tell you, I once had a deal. Um, it, it, it was a non-substantive deal, really, but we, it, was, it was back when I was in private practice. I mean, we actually, it was a company acquiring a, one company, but they had assets in Australia and China, and we actually bifurcated the deal. I mean, because Australia is a voluntary jurisdiction, right? So, I mean, to, to not hold up Australia for anyone knows how long, we made it two transactions um, instead of one. I mean, it, it really affected the deal structure. So yeah. it's, it's, it's a tough one. So, but let's go back to the U.S. Let's assume we're going to have a second request. Okay, let's assume we take your six months, right? Okay, that's a, that's, I think, I, I guess I would agree that's as good a straw man as any. Because, and we're, it is a straw man. And we're talking about six months in addition to the four that yeah. you, three to four that you mentioned. Right. But so you got, you got, what if you're going to, what if you want to litigate? How much, how much time do you have to build in if you're going to, we'll come back to whether we should agree to litigate, different question. But how much time do we need to add for that? I mean, if you look at, actual deals that have gone through the full litigation process, you're looking at, you know, probably 18 months minimum. I mean, um, yeah. And so I think the thing we need to recognize, uh, just to sum up this part of it, is to say if the, the timing impact, putting aside the substance as to whether you'll get the deal done, whether you'll have to agree to remedies, the timing impact can be significant. And I will say this, I said, you know, Brendan, if you're going to talk to your, your, your biz dev guys when they're selling an asset, I mean, do you think they really appreciate that time impact? And obviously, that time is money and time is risk. But do people really take, do, do, are people good at, at factoring that in, in terms of what it means for your process and making decisions on who you want to get to the next round? I think to some extent, yeah, people are aware that, um, you know, different transactions uh, and different buyers are going to carry a different level of antitrust risk, including the time element to it. Um, and I think there's been enough over the last few years of, uh, that, that's come out of, you know, transactions affected by ex-U.S. filing regimes, you know, China obviously being a, a key one. So I think it's it's percolating, you know, into a lot of corporate biz dev departments. Um, that said, I think it's uh, it, it's something in terms of how you quantify that. Uh, still, probably a challenge because it's it's an uncertainty at the end of the day. Yeah, I mean, I just a deal I worked on earlier this summer. London Stock Exchange Group is acquiring Refinitiv. We signed it up on August one. We announced to, when we announced the deal, we said. We expect to close in the second half of 2020. Mm -hmm. okay? We were basically managing, we managed, we wanted to manage people's expectations. Don't expect to see this deal close before the fall of 2020. And I, going back to what you guys said, you know, that's, that's, that's completely realistic. Mm -hmm. one, other, um, timing, one, one other timing wild card, China's a wild card, but Brexit's a wild card too. Because if you're lose, if 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 there is a Brexit, then your deal will flip over to the CMA in London. And does anybody have any idea what the hell is going to happen then? Uh, there have been a bunch of client alerts, slow review articles, whatever, that have been written about what the CMA and the EU have said about what they're going to do in the case of of, of Brexit and which deals will transition to the CMA, which will continue to be reviewed by by the European Commission, um, it's going to be a lot of confusion, I think, as with so much else about Brexit. So. <laughs> well, and I will, but we, having looked at this issue, I think what you would say, whatever timelines you have for the EU, the CMA is longer. I mean, that's it's, right. you know, it's just like it's not. That's the bad news. It's not going to be. It's not going to be any better. It's it's going to be longer. So yeah, but it's a, it's, it's a voluntary jurisdiction. So, yep. um, but. If you're, if you do wind up having to notify there, it's a pretty onerous notification. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a, and it's, it, it, they are not the. I will just say this: they are not the easiest jurisdiction to deal with as as things go, um, and they're and they're going to be understaffed, and so you're going to have issues because they're just not going to have the people they need to deal with whatever it is they're going to do to you. Um, so, and let me so, let's go through a hypothetical. 
and then we'll open it up to some questions after I get something from the panel. You're on a sell side, okay? You're running a sell side. When, and maybe I'll ask Brendan to start, when on the sell side do you filter in the antitrust risks for your buyers? At what point do you put that into the calculus? Because, you know, your bankers have, have sent, you know, they, they've talked to 20 people, okay? You're going to run, you're going to run antitrust on 20 people? That's a lot of work, okay? But, but at what point in the process do you start to, to, to have that filter into your considerations on the sell side? Yeah, well, I, I don't think it affects who you go out to initially, right? I mean, you're, even people who may have uh, a, a higher antitrust risk profile as a buyer for you, uh, you probably still need to go out to them with you know, the teaser, try to get an NDA, sign up, get them the SIM. I mean, obviously, you need to make sure the SIM has been, has been appropriately vetted uh, by your antitrust advisors. Um, so at that point, I think you're, you're all on the same page. But as you start to winnow that group down, uh, whether you're selecting you know, uh, a group to move on to the second round or, or what have you, um, I, I think you start to factor that into the analysis, at least at a high level, starting to think about which of these buyers are going to um, you know, affect deal certainty from an antitrust perspective, just as you would from a financing risk perspective or any other right. aspect of the deal that affects the certainty, which is obviously the critical point that you're concerned of, um, well, along with price as the seller. And let's talk about that from the buy side. Let's start maybe with you, Chuck. You start with, okay, because and, and you, Gil, you guys obviously do, you, you buy more often than you sell. When do you actually engage in, on the buy side? How early on do you actually, you know, do a substantive antitrust analysis of your buy side target? I'd say as soon as you possibly can. I mean, it's, uh, let's look at the scenario Brandon put out there. You know, you, you got a sim from a seller. It's going gonna, it's, it's gonna to contain limited, limited information, but then I think from a in-house counsel perspective, it's critical to go talk to your business people in, in line of business and really get a detailed understanding there of where the issues lie, how, but both from the substantive, from, from the substantive standard of where the overlaps are, where the, where the vertical issues are, but also where, the, back to timing, where the filings are going to be uh, to get a sense of that, sense of that deal timing. I think those conversations are critical up front um, because that's going to really play into both the antitrust analysis, but also your negotiating strategy for the deal. I mean, let me ask this. Our, our deals are often not prompted by the receipt of a confidential information memorandum. I mean, often it's people in a business. I'm seeing Dan Mangi used to be at Cisco. Not as sad. I mean, it's often it's people in a, in a business who see a company and think, gee, that would be great to have that company be part of Cisco. Um, and in the time between when that thought occurs and when, you know, I, I first learned about the deal, hopefully it's not too long because what tends to happen in that time is people write things mm -hmm. that may not <laughs> be great um, <laughs> later on. So, um, I, you know, I, I want to get involved early and I want to kind of at least offer some early stage messaging guidance at a very early stage in, a, in, in, a, in, in consideration. And you know, it's great to be in house and, and be in a position to be able to be able to do that. Um, from then on, you know, you're just sort of progressively gathering information. Um, obviously, your ability to do that can be somewhat limited by the number of people at the company that are disclosed on, on, on the deal, which is often quite small and will get larger over time. But, but at a very early stage, maybe, you know, five people. It, so we've started to go through some of the preliminaries here, and we've kind of gone through what we'll call the front end. Um, the warm-ups, and we'll get to uh, the next stage. We'll talk about actually risk allocation, negotiation, how, how the, the parties deal with that. But before we do, um, wanted to just see whether there's anybody in the audience who has questions or comments. I mean, look, people have dealt with this, and other people, I know some people in the audience, who've dealt with these issues. Questions, comments would be welcome from everyone. Thanks. Uh, can, we, can you hear me okay? Is it working? Uh, what are your top three areas, would you say, minimizes um, antitrust concerns? Uh, you know, you talked about England. You talked about Asia Pacific. Um, you know, we've, I've done a lot of deals with U.S. to U.S. companies. Mm -hmm. But if you're looking, for example, to uh, remove HSR risk, and you, you mentioned, uh, you know, uh, timelines, uh, what are your thoughts on that? 
What do you mean in terms of how to reduce the? Uh, yeah, in terms of the buyer. So if I'm a seller and I'm looking for a buyer, do I go to Japan? Are you looking uh, to do something out of England? I I'd say that that the, the jurisdiction doesn't matter that much. It's the question of where they where where and it's where and how they compete, and you know put it this way, best way to do it is to go to ask. I'd say to start, let's assume it's a business unit. I go ask the guys in the business unit. Who are your competitors? And oh, by the way, don't don't ask them in an email. Maybe you yeah, know, yeah. just walk into their office, <laughs> walk into their office, and say, "Okay, who are your competitors?" And start it from there. I'd, I'd like you guys to. I think the only my only caveat to that is if you're looking at say in your sell side situation and they're competing buyers, one of which is going to require a SAMR filing in China, and the yeah. other one's not. That can have a material effect. And let's assume no issue there. Even that can have a material effect. And, on and that's what I'm talking about. Yeah. So if all things are equal. Take competition out of it, and you're looking strictly from a regulatory perspective when you're looking at, um, you know, what type of reviews China has to go through versus Japan versus England in order to get a, a transaction consummated. Um, yeah, that, that's that's where my I think my interest was most I mostly to, at. I just want to point out that your ability to map out yeah. exactly where you're going to have to notify is hard. Is limited early in a deal process. You can tell the antitrust person in any deal process, because they're the ones that are asking the corporate dev people, so have you gotten target revenue, by country revenue information yet? That's a question that I ask early, and often the answer is, you know, it's a little bit early, maybe we'll get in a couple of weeks when we, we know we have a real deal here. Um, and, and that's the information that, that, that I need to tell you, where like, you where, where you're actually going to have to notify. Um, I mean, there's some places where it's market share, and those, are, those present their own quirks. But... Um, and, and you often don't get that information from, from targets early in a shop process. Um, so your ability to kind of do an accurate timeline early in a deal process is, can be pretty limited. It's, it's hard because, as Gil's saying, it's not, and oh, by the way, in some countries, the way they count revenue is not the way that you from a business, your business people would count revenue. Some of it's quite idiosyncratic. So it's, it's, it's hard. I think that's the challenge is exactly what you brought up. And also, you know, you're looking at uh, what different offers and you're trying to make a decision uh, which offer is real, what, you know, what's the expenses and the timeline to get through a transaction. Those all come into play. So it's a very fascinating subject. And, and by the way, I was supposed to introduce myself. I'm Sean Brynjolson from uh, Eaton Pharmaceuticals. Okay. Thank you. Others? Hi, I'm Abhishek Jain from Schneider Electric. So apart from antitrust, there are other regulatory concerns as well, CFOs and similar filings around the world now. What does that add in terms of timing and uncertainty? So, so let me start with CFIUS, okay? Um, and we could go on. I think I, I, I am going to be, this is going to be a very thin veneer of CFIUS, okay? One, very hard to predict the timing of CFIUS. CFIUS is still uh, understaffed, okay? And therefore, you know, what you do in CFIUS is you're filing, you basically, it's the way you do it in the EU, you submit a draft, and you'll do some iterations of the draft before they'll accept it, and then they put you on the timeline. They'll put you on the, on the statutory timeline. That can take, you know, that can take, you know, two or three months, depending on what the issues are. So CFIUS is, at this stage, you know, if there are serious issues, okay, um, is, is a bit of a wild card. The other thing, I, more than a bit of a wild card, the other thing I'd say is, you know, you, you need to look at CFIUS in a broad, uh, in a very broad way. And the new regulations that CFIUS has come out with, what people do not focus on as much as they need to, and it'll affect a lot of people in this room who haven't thought about it before, is sensitive personal data, mm. okay? That, the CFIUS is very focused on that, and I would guess that a very, like, not many, how many people in this room who work at a company that has, has, uh, has technology that's subject to export controls? Okay? Guess what? Mandatory CFIUS filing, depending on what it is, okay? But you, you should assume you're going to do mandatory CFIUS filings if people want to buy some of that stuff from you. But how many people in this room have sensitive personal data? Okay? Ding, 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 you, get a, you ring the CFIUS bell now, okay? And that is going to sweep into CFIUS a, a, lot of, a lot of companies that weren't there before. So that's a, 
Um, you know, that's, that's something in and of itself. Maybe you should put that on the list for next year, William. But, um, you know, I don't know if we could go down this rabbit hole forever. But. Yeah, I'd also just point out that um, just as antitrust noted, the number of places around the world that are, that are requiring antitrust notification Cepheus. has increased. Um, you've seen a significant growth in the number of places that have some form of national security notification requirement. France, to pick a recent example that we've run across. Germany. Um, Germany as well. England. Um, they just and blocked something this week, I think. Yeah. England, just blocked, just, blocked England just blocked a deal last week on national security <coughs> grounds. You're absolutely right. So, so. Um, th th this definitely needs to be added to your checklist if it isn't on it already because um, it, 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 those processes, I mean, you're dealing with new, new agencies performing new responsibilities under new statutes, um, none of which is a recipe for getting your deal through quickly. Um, <laughs> Other other questions? Nope. Hi, Brad West, uh, PGT Innovations, uh, manufacturer in Florida. My question is about HSR filing as, at the point of a letter of intent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And as a as a public company, you're we've we actually have not ultimately done this, but we've contemplated it. And the whole question comes about is that when you file your HSR filing on LOI, it's actually public, even though you haven't signed a deal or announced it yet. Is that true or is that not true? And from a buyer and seller's perspective, what do you, what do you, what do you think is the concept of filing on an LOI? If, if, it's, a binding LO, if it's a binding LOA, you can do it. Um, you know, the, 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 the trick is um, you, you, you do it, you request early termination. Two weeks later, something appears in the Federal Register that your deal's been approved and it hasn't been made public yet. So if, if you want the FTC to be your, um, the, the way your deal gets announced, um, great. <laughs> Most people don't. But, what if you um, don't. but what if you don't request early termination? Yeah, you cannot request early termination, um, which, which is fine. Um, you're definitely looking at 30 days at that point. But, but, but I do think the other thing you have to think about, and maybe I'll, I'll ask Brendan to weigh in, is how you weigh, okay? The, so to get, you don't have to have much in a letter of intent for it to be accepted for HSR. Um, you have to have, I think is the statute, a bona fide intention to complete the deal, or words to that effect, okay? Um, but you don't have to have much, and it can be, I've, we've done them on one page, uh, with not very, very few terms, okay? But, but it has to be binding. But I, yes, but it says we're, we intend to do this deal. Um, but the question is, what if, maybe, Brendan, you want to weigh in on the disclosure conundrum that now puts you in? Yeah, well, I guess it depends, right? If, if it's a material transaction for you and you're, you're going to have a disclosure obligation potentially triggered as a result of just entering into that LOI, if it's, uh, I mean, I'm guessing if it's that material of a transaction, you're probably not going to be comfortable just yeah. relying on that LOI. Uh, and, and even you know, if it does remain confidential, if you don't ask for early termination, uh, because of all the typical reasons people don't like to enter into binding agreements to agree. Um, that said, I mean, I, you know, it's, it's, it's a calculated, you know, you got to weigh that risk and benefit. I, I'd say this. I think you, public companies do uh, file LOIs without disclosing, you know, for, I'd say, divisional sales that aren't, you know, material, whatever that means, all the time. I don't think I've ever seen one or heard of one for an entire company sale. Um, I, you know, that would, I, had, I don't know, Brendan, that seems like a bridge too far to me. Yeah, I, I don't think anybody's going to do that. But then you get into that, where are you and how do you, you know, you've, you've got a bona fide intent to try to do this and you're trying to, to take the position that you're, I don't have, I haven't triggered a disclosure obligation. You know, if it's really, you know, if, look, if you're a, a $2 billion market cap company and you're selling something for $100 million, you know, you can, I think you can get there as you start to, I don't know, just to take some random numbers. But as you start to move up from that, it's going to get, I don't know, it starts to get hard. Yeah. I, I, I think, yeah, I mean, look, if you can, I think if you have a deal that's not going to be disclosable, even if you'd sign the purchase agreement because it's not material, yeah. then, yeah, this is a potential avenue forward if you're comfortable relying on this agreement to agree, which, you know, that's, that's a tough thing, I think, for a lot of companies to swallow. Well, and it's also you don't, people, again, if you have anything like a competitive process, if you're the seller, 
do you really want to take the asset off the market um, at that point when, as you say, you have an agreement to agree? I, it's, 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 it's a hard one. So maybe if there's one more, and then we'll kind of move into uh, kind, of, kind of negotiations. Hi, Lindsay Swiger, uh, ExxonMobil. Um, this is going to relate back to a comment that Brendan made earlier about how um, generally people understand these timelines, especially if you're a sophisticated party. Um, but with the amount of changes, um, uncertainty, China, Brexit, those kinds of things, how do um, particularly in-house counsel or other people that are um, kind of in more of a supportive role, how can you bring those things to the business development people without seeming to, to, to kind of put the brakes on and hinder them? Is there a, a more constructive way to say, you know, this is going to take a long time and your deal isn't going to close for 18 months? I'll give, I'll give you my, the easiest way to do it is because you don't know is to basically put on a one page, one page what, you know, with broad ranges what the timetables are in, for different jurisdictions and say, at this stage, I don't know which of those will be necessary, but if they are, put one page with your timelines, then you can go back and that's a frame of reference. It's a visual frame of reference for them to start to, to actually to help them internalize it. That's kind of the, the way I like to do it. Because you know, many of my, many of my clients have very short attention spans, as do I, um, and it, it's those kind of visuals help. I don't know if you guys. Yeah, have if if there's one thing I think that's always helpful, if you can say, hey, look at this deal X Y Z company did. Maybe there are some similarities there. Maybe there aren't, but you can you can point those out. If there's similarities, that's great. Say it took them one and a half years, or it took them nine months to get clearance. So. You know, just keep that in mind uh, as we start down point. this path. <clears throat> yeah, and because, because I'd say it's also just in your interest in those discussions to say, look, it's it's in my interest here to be overly conservative as opposed to being overly aggressive and getting it wrong on the other end because you, you don't you don't be in that situation. Right? Well, I, I think the other thing is there are, as I think Gil mentioned, there are some things you can do to shorten those timelines. Okay, but a lot of it is completely outside of the party's control. Yeah. Okay, you're dealing with a government. You know, these are people who work for the government. They have a job to do, and they don't really care about your timeline, okay? Um, well, they, 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 they'll be cognizant of it, but it's not going to guide them that much. Um, so I think business, you need to basically say, look, uh, can I, maybe can we, can we file it three weeks sooner than that? You know, so, it's, so you give yourself some ranges of times. But there are, you know, to, to Brendan's point, giving people real world of examples of what other companies, particularly if they're ones they respect, what happened to them is, is a good way to kind of manage expectations. Just, just a couple of sort of act, practical kind of counseling points in response to your question. Um, one is, while there are things you can do before announce to collect information, the issue that I often run into is that the same people that <laughs> have that information are the people that are, you know, knee deep in alligators dealing with the deal process. Correct. So how much time they're going to give me to respond to my request for detailed by country financial data for sales of particular products in a particular place, you know, maybe, maybe not. So the ability to actually, like, get a lot of data and do a lot of work before announce can be just limited by the bandwidth of the people that have that, have that information. The other is, and, and Chuck mentioned gun jumping earlier, it's important as part of that advice to convey to people that no, they're not taking control of the target <laughs> while all this is going on. <laughs> so, and they, 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 the, the target will remain separate, will continue to operate its business. If they compete with you, they're going to continue to compete with you. Um, and, and setting that expectation early is, is important. Yeah, to, just the business people need to understand if there are RFPs going out, and guess what? The, the buyer and the target are competing for it. They're competing for it, yeah. and that's just gonna. That's something people are gonna have and to. And live you don't get with. to call them and say, "Hey, maybe you don't want to bid for this one." <laughs> yeah, just um, <laughs> at the most extreme, and it goes far beyond that. So let's talk about actually um, negotiating the risk allocation provisions. Okay, so we're gonna assume here. Let's just take a hypothetical, and um, Brendan and I will, you know, play the parts of the sell side. And uh, Gil and Chuck will be on the parts of the buy side because in their companies they probably, you know, buy a lot more often than they sell. But so let's take a hypothetical. Let's just say it's uh, 
it's, it's, it's a, a process, and we're on the sell side, and we're telling people that we're going to let, you know, two or three people into the second round, maybe four. P, you know, let's say three, two to four people in the second round. You're one of them, okay? And let's assume, you know, that, um, that Gil um, or Chuck, they're in the second round, but they do have some antitrust risk. And it, it, it's, we, we're, you know, it could be, and maybe the question is, is it low, medium, or high? We don't know yet, but they have some, okay? And Brendan's, you know, Brendan and I are going to call them up and say, you've got some antitrust risk here, okay? There are other people in the process who have very little. How are you going to help us out? How are you going to level the playing field with the, how are you going to try and get back? Because you know what? You're in a hole. The speech I'm going to give is, you're in a hole. And, but I'm here to help you dig yourself out of that hole. I'm just trying to help you guys because you're in a hole. So I'm going to send you a contract. That contract's going to have what everyone calls a hell or high water provision, which is a stupid term, but let's put that aside for a moment. So. Brendan, if we're on a sell side in that situation, you will send out a contract with a hell or high water, meaning you have to do anything and everything, including selling your children into slavery. <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> yeah I, I think that that certainly does the trick uh, of evening the playing field from the seller's perspective, or at least bringing it as close as possible, given that one party may have risk and one may not. OK, so then I'll ask a question for you guys. OK, we've sent that out. For a buyer that actually has meaningful, some meaningful antitrust risk, how often does a buyer with meaningful antitrust risk actually sign that? I'd say very, very rarely in my, uh, <laughs> in my experience. I could recall once <laughs> in my 20 years experience. Yeah, I mean, I, I would never advise a client to accept that. And yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I will say I have seen it where people have, it's a very competitive process. And where there are certain types of antitrust risk that are frankly easier to quantify and calibrate than others. Um, and so, deal I did years ago, we were selling kidney dialysis clinics. It's actually, you know what? There's a, and the government's looked at it, they've looked at a ton of those deals, and you can predict within a reasonable degree of tolerance what that's going to look like, and you can assess that risk. And people have done it. I, you know, I, the buyer in, who got that deal actually did um, because he needed to catch. He, he had the worst antitrust risks. Wanted to, he wanted to win. I'll tell you, and that hypo, the hypothetical phone call you just had, uh, if I got that from you, I'd say, okay, our joint, our joint goal is to get this deal through and to get regulatory approval. Let's please not put, because they're so rare in my experience, let's not put a massive red flag on page 21 of the agreement that any agency is going to pick up on, therefore leading to the scrutiny that we're trying to avoid in the first place. Let's actually have a reasonable conversation about how to control that risk and not to create this elephant that is going to basically create a flag, which is going to lead in itself to what we are trying to avoid. Well, let me, let me ask another, that leads me into the next question, which is at that point in time when we've started to have that, those discussions, right? I'm giving my speech, you're giving your speech. Uh, but before we do that, how much substantive work have we done? How well do we understand the antitrust risk? Before, I mean, Gil, how well do you want to understand the antitrust bef risk before you engage in that conversation? Quite better than I do. Um, I, I think that um, you understand the buyer perspective on the antitrust risk. You may not have a great sense of what the seller's documents say. Yeah. Um, I mean, this is probably a statement against interest, but you know, there's an entire venture capital industry in Silicon Valley that funds companies so that they can be acquired by a Google, a Facebook, maybe an Intel, maybe a Cisco. Um, and the pitch deck that the startup is going to provide to its VCs to get funding is going to be, you know, like we're going to disrupt this industry in the following ways, and we're going to disrupt incumbents in that industry, and they may mention, like, my client's name or, you know, or Google or someone. And, um, you know, if, if there's a lot of that, um, then going into an agency and saying, you know, boy, these guys really weren't all that material to us. There are seven other companies that do what they do, et cetera. 
um, may not may not be like the most credible opening opening statement because they're going to have all sorts of bad stuff about how their mission in life was 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 to drive you out of business. Um, so that's the stuff that I typically don't know, and one of the ways that I would respond to an aggressive ask for antitrust risk protection from from a seller would be to say, um, you know, kind of come let us reason together. Let's talk about a process whereby we can get some information from your company mm -hmm. um, and we can provide you some information from our company. We'll keep that information to a pretty small group of people, um, but that'll help us come to, you know, kind of a shared view relative to antitrust risk, which will maybe not eliminate this as a source of dispute in the negotiation, but maybe um, narrow the range a little bit between what, you know, what we perceive and what you perceive, and maybe that gets us beyond hell or high water to something that's kind of more in the in the realm of something that we could actually sell to our board. Yeah. I, I will say, to build on what, what Gil is saying here, that uh, my strong advice to clients is to have to try and do some work, to have an antitrust lawyer who has sat down, at least sat down with the people who understand the markets and the products so that they can give some advice on, and share some of that information you may not come to agreement, but I, I don't know. My experience is people are rarely, you know, miles apart. They may be this far apart, but they're really rarely that far apart. And that frames the discussion in a better way. We're not just shouting hell or high water, I'll never accept it, my board will never do that. You can actually then, then you can start to talk about, okay, what is reasonable? What can be done? Okay? Now... The standard that you see in most contracts is, and I'll you know, turn this one to Brendan, is reasonable best efforts, okay? Is anybody actually, if you have serious antitrust risk, does anybody actually go forward with a contract that just simply says the parties will use reasonable best efforts and not say more? What's your experience? Uh, no, I think that if there's, a, if there's a real potential antitrust issue, um, you're going to, You'll have that language in there, some efforts, but then you're going to say what that means with some level of detail. Uh, will you litigate? To what degree will you litigate? Will you uh, uh, dispose of assets? Are there thresholds? Are there standards? Uh, to what uh, degree of pain you're willing to accept as the buyer to get the deal done? And so how do you, do, how do you describe the degree of pain? I mean, do you use words? Do you use, I've seen revenue. I've seen, I've seen actually production capacity in certain industries because that's the way they, but how do you, as an antitrust lawyer, I'll ask the antitrust lawyers two questions. How do you describe that? And how worried are you about signaling your position to the antitrust authorities? I'd say there's really two issues here. I mean, are there, what are you willing to give up in terms of divestiture, remedies, et cetera? And that can be described as you say revenue. It could be particular lines of business. It could be production. Uh, and then the second phase is how long are you willing to fight? Are you going to go through second request? Are you going to go, do you, do, are, are you requiring a judicial challenge? Uh, is it preliminary injunction? Anything, anything beyond that? Um, I'll tell you, the more, as from my, from my perspective, the more specific we get, obviously the danger is the more, the greater signal you're giving to the agency, uh, that there's, there's your root map of how you challenge the transaction. Now, of course, especially in the U.S., if you say in the contract, yeah, we're, we're going to litigate this until, uh, up until the Supreme Court gives, grants a cert, um, that can give it a, a signal to the other way of the agency, that, you know, if you're going to challenge us here, you've got to fight on your hands and, and uh, be expected to that. But in terms of specific assets and stuff, uh, you know, specific assets you're going to divest, you, know, it's, uh, there's, you have that risk. Query whether there's a place you can put that other than in the definitive agreement, and if the seller would agree to that. But I think that's another, uh, another issue to explore. Well, we can, look, we, 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 let's, find, we can, let's stay away from that rabbit hole because we can yeah. go down that yeah. forever. Yeah. Let, let me I mean, make, make one observation and then maybe disagree with Chuck a little bit. Um, so the first is that the question of how quantifiable efforts provisions are really varies a lot across deals and across industries. I think, to, to a point you made earlier, um, there, there are, you know, there are spaces, they just don't happen to be the ones that I'm in, 
um, that you know bank mergers, where you can you know really kind of know to a degree of certainty what divestitures or branches will be will be required. Um, in in the tech world, often you're dealing with non-structural remedies, behavioral yeah. remedies, licenses. Google ITA being my favorite example. The consent decree in that case is like 20 pages long or something. Um, Comcast NBC is another example. These are incredibly detailed behavioral commitments, and predicting with a high degree of certainty what exactly they're going to say. Is, is, is hard. Um, so once you get into the world of non-divestiture, non-structural remedies, you're talking about you know, licensing interfaces, maybe agreeing to arbitrate rate setting with, with customers and, and deal with vertical issues, et cetera. Or, or license on a FRAN basis. License on a FRAN basis, um, certain IP. Um, those, are, those are really hard to kind of put into, put, put into anything but you know, fairly high level, high level words. Um, now, come to the point of where on, on signaling, um, I actually have not found this to be a huge issue, even in deals where we've specified the, um, you know, the, the efforts commitments to a fairly high degree. I think the agencies kind of pride themselves on deciding for themselves whether there's a problem, and if so, what the remedy will be. And um, they're certainly aware and, and maybe view things you say as a little bit of, of, of guidance, but ultimately they want to make their own decisions. One thing, perhaps in contradiction to what I just said, <laughs> deals with very high break fees tend to attract attention because they have very high break fees, because the very high break fees become the subject of discussion. You know, the deal professor in the New York Times writes an article about the, why, why did this company agree to a 80% break fee, et cetera. Those deals tend to get attention because the agencies kind of think, gee, there's something, there's something there. So, um, and, and so the public company deals and break fees are, are public. So um, that's my only caveat. But in terms of detailed efforts provisions, I, I, I haven't found that the agencies pay a lot of attention to them as a, as a roadmap. And, and, and Gil, I, I agree with you in the U.S., but I think where I get more nervous is outside of the United States. I think with in, some in, of the, with in the some EU, of the, I, uh, my EU partners hate it yeah. because they think the signaling to the uh, commission is palpable. They worry, they worry about a lot. Um, just so let's talk about for a minute about reverse break fees, and um, then throw it open to some questions. You know, I'll observe. Okay, when you look at it, you know, one reverse break fees for antitrust, they are, you know, they vary a lot in terms of size. I mean, if you measure them the way you measure break fees normally, is uh, for you know for public deals is on equity value, percentage of equity value. And if you use that metric, two things I'll observe. They vary all over the place, but actually the quantum of them has come down um, over the last uh, several years um, as a percentage. The other thing I would observe is you may have a commitment. Sometimes you couple them with a commitment to divest. It's sometimes, I, it's, it's often not either or, mm -hmm. okay? So you can have, you can have both. And I think then, though, they serve different purposes. And I don't know if, you, if you've seen them. And I think the quantum goes down if you couple them with a, with, with a commitment. I don't know. Is that your experience, Gil? Yeah. I mean, we really see reverse break fees in isolation. We see rever reverse break fees as part of a package. And mm -hmm. the other parts of the package are efforts commitments that we've been talking about. And also, what, what's the outside date? And yep. what optionality does it provide the seller to, to pull the ripcord? Um, so those three typically get negotiated together um, in a you know complex package, and uh, this is what takes a lot of time sometimes in antitrust risk allocation negotiations. So, so why don't we throw it open so to questions, comments, other people's experience um, on these topics? Anybody in the back? Brian Crandall from Knowles Corporation. Uh, my question was really around China. You guys touched on it briefly, but if you're <laughs> divesting and Chinese buyer interested, how do you set expectations these days? You mean a Chinese buyer as your to buy a U.S. asset? Yes. Uh, I think you should set those expectations pretty darn low. <laughs> like, is it possible? Well, I, yeah, Ken, I, I will put it this way. Um, again, we should have a CFIUS panel next, <laughs> next time. But can a Chinese company buy, you know, a matchbook manufacturer, to take an absurd example? Well, probably, okay? Um, 
but I think a Chinese buyer for um, at uh, for a, a, is going to be difficult in any number of industries. And I think people sometimes, you know, say, "Oh, it's all because of the trade wars." Well, no, it's not. Okay, uh, it, that is a problem, and that's a real serious problem. But I, you know, don't underestimate the fact that the U.S. security agencies, the Department of Defense, the NSA, the CIA, view China as an existential threat. And they see China trying to compete in um, artificial intelligence. That's a security threat for the United States, they would say. They would say that is a serious security threat. They would say, actually, that China trying to make the yuan a reserve currency is a security threat. Because actually, if they do that, that will take, out, take away perhaps our most powerful weapon in international relations. Mm -hmm. So I, China is going to be very tough for, you know, for a while. And even if we get past the trade, China will continue to be a challenge. I don't know if you guys have a different view. I just no. make the point that it, it works the other way, too. Um, getting a U.S. acquisition or a U.S. joint venture with a Chinese company approved, um, unless there's something really strongly in it for China and not just the target, and unless the target is um, pretty well connected and can help push your deal through, will also be a, a long process. China's, I mean, Chinese, the SAMR has gotten to be, you know, a relative, a more sophisticated agency than it was, than MOFCOM was five years ago. Um, but nevertheless, they're small. Um, and when they go out, they go, they, they canvass all the ministries. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they're really, I mean, SAMR is really understaffed, which yeah, exactly. explains a little bit about why things take as long as they do. And if you if you talk to people there, they'll they'll kind of admit that that they don't have the the resources that that they need. They're getting more sophisticated. They're getting smarter about particular industries. They're getting smarter about remedies. Yep. Um, but it's still you know they, they have too few people doing too much deal volume. Yeah. Others. Um, I have a somewhat philosophical question, actually. There's a school of thought that says that U.S. antitrust policy has been actually getting lax over time, over a long time frame. If you look at it, you know, in statistics, people look at it as sort of DOJ inquiries into antitrust, M&A issues, and HHI index in all sectors of the economy uniformly going up, right? And obviously, I mean, you know, we're all busy. It's important topics to talk about. But kind of stepping back, you are kind of career professionals in this issue. Five, ten years from now, do you see the paradigm changing? Uh, I mean, there is like technology industry, you know, all the concentration, people waking up to that. There's political, you know, kind of uh, paradigm there. Like, where is this is going long term? Uh, who wants to go first, Chuck <laughs> or, or Gil? You know, I, a lot of that, I mean, it's the antitrust right now is most topical, uh, certainly has been in my career, and, um, you know, it's in presidential debates, et cetera. I personally don't see us moving away from a consumer welfare standard approach, uh, for, for instance, but the consumer welfare standard approach, consumer welfare standard approach, excuse me, I'm talking too fast, it can be pretty broad. Um, and it can take into fa factors such as innovation. Uh, and um, uh, and dynamic competition, so I think potentially you'll see more focus uh, on that. And you know, I think what what scares me though also is we look outside the United States uh, again, thinking South Africa with some of the social policies and their competition law, which that seems to be kind of a growing trend as well. You're just expanding kind of the notion, especially outside the United States, of what even anti antitrust uh, looks at. You see that in China um, as well, taking some of the more broader industrial. Uh, um, uh, uh, um, uh, considerations. So, Gail? I don't have a lot to add to that. I mean, I think that there's a fundamental question of what we want antitrust policy to do. Um, <laughs> and d do we want it to focus on kind of more tangible considerations like, like you know, price output, innovation, the traditional sort of core concerns of antitrust, at least in the U.S. for the last, you know, 30 years or so? 
or do we want it to do do a broader set of things? And if we want to do a broader set of things, then to some extent you got to change the laws because they're at least interpreted now as being very focused on those issues, whether rightly or wrongly. Any any other questions, comments, thoughts? Here we go. James Harris from Google. So one of the questions is, you've got this long runway. What are the thoughts around the operating covenant? Uh, mm. Which is probably a whole other part. <laughs> because I think there is this, you know, how do you set so that you keep the management, letting the company run itself, but also have oversight on it. Because if it is a year in tech, that's a, a lifetime. So how do you, what are thoughts, guidance on that? <laughs> you guys want to start? This is a subject of some, uh, regular discussion between me and our regular outside deal counsel, a firm that is pretty widely, it's Fenwick, pretty widely known. And, and one of the points that I make to them occasionally is, like, be careful what you ask for, because you want to set a materiality threshold at a point where um, you're not tying the target in knots. And also, frankly, you know, every time they want to do some ordinary course transaction, you don't have to like approve it because that starts to take a lot of time and effort. So y you do have to be, be thoughtful about what the, what the operating covenant should look like, um, while at the same time focusing on what really is important to you in terms of making sure they don't do anything crazy. Well, look, I mean, there are certain things that, you know, like capital expenditures, okay, there's some easy things that you can say that's off the table, but the harder, we're talking about the commercial part of the, right, the commercial. Uh, I would, the, I, to build on what Gil's saying, I would say, look, one of the useful ways to think about this is if you set, set the threshold, however you establish it, how often are they going to have to come and talk to you during the course of the year, okay? And at some point is you say, well, that could be 20. And you say, are you really going to want to talk to them about that often about that issue? And I argue to my clients that then you don't have, you got the threshold too low because you got, you got, you, how often is this, you're going to have this dialogue? Uh, and you really got to think about it, how it's going to play out. I think that's a useful way to get people to be, you know, frankly, have a little, sanity about it. And, uh, and, and to put it in a legal framework as well, I'll, I'll go back to where I started. If my world, 5% of my deals have substantive antitrust issues, but 95%, all 100% have gun jumping issues. I mean, again, you don't, you, you don't want to get to year, where you're coming to you for everything, and there, there could be an, an argument there that you prematurely assumed a level of control that is inappropriate under competition or, or antitrust laws. And I'll just observe that, you know, the gun jumping issues are serious in the U.S., in the EU. If anything, they're worse. Yep. So just, you know, you've really got to be thoughtful about these things. And as you say, be careful what you wish for. Yeah, I would just add one, one other observation, which is just as important as the frequency is what's the approval process yeah. at the buyer and who's going to be involved in it, particularly in a deal that either involves a competitor or yeah. a, a supplier to your competitors. Because there's information that yep. you yep. need mm -hmm. for the approval process legitimately that you don't want sloshing around within the buyer. So what are the guidelines in terms of who's going to have access to that, who's going to be involved? What are the bases on which you're going to make those decisions? Those are all interesting questions. All right, are we? Yeah, we've run out of time, but we oh, certainly man. have run out of things to talk about, that's for sure. So, um, but uh, unless there's any final closing comments, um, why don't we continue the conversation during the break over a cup of coffee? So Sounds thanks, you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.